When I say Sistine Chapel, is there one scene in that famous fresco that you kind of think of? If we could just get house lights up for just a second, I know that may not be something. Well, at least, never mind, I'll just do this. I can see you now. It's like I can't see you, and now I can see you. Um, can somebody just like do, okay, right there, okay, stand up, stand up. Okay, which one of you is God and which one of you is Adam? I think that's obvious, right? No. <laughs> okay, you see what they're doing? They're doing that, that motion right there, fantastic. Wow, thank you. Give it up for those two right there. That scene in this marvelous, huge fresco has kind of become shorthand, hasn't it? Shorthand for the whole of the thing. It's like literally this one scene represents this great, great, grand, larger thing. I want to come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but I want to get there sort of in a backward way. A couple of years ago, my parents brought out a house, uh, or out to my house, a box of my old stuff that my mom said, like, I was going through this stuff, Chad. I just couldn't throw it away. This is going to be something, if, if it's going to get thrown away, you're going to have to do it. I can't do it. It was like my trophies. Uh, my Letterman jacket, which, you know, I get great use out of today. Um, I had some old letters and some old pictures. And as I was going through all this stuff, I was thinking about myself and who I had been. And, and I was marveling now in my 40s, like, man, I have changed so much in that time. And I think on one level, that's something that's pretty obvious. I'm, I'm, it's a good thing that, I, uh, that I, I hate to think that I hadn't changed since my high school years, but looking at myself in those pictures and in those sort of uh, artifacts of Chad's life, remembering myself, I remembered how zealous of a Christian I was and how much uh, I wanted to be even more. I was reflecting on what I knew and even uh, sort of respected my former self for being willing to be so sold out for the gospel. But then I was also marveling at what I had come to learn about God since that time reflecting on, wow, I was really sold out, but I knew just a fraction of what I have come to know in the time since. As I continued to look through the pictures, I really remembered how many doubts I actually had as a result. I was zealous, but I also had doubts. Think about that. Now, to clarify, I didn't have doubts about the claims of Christ. Uh, instead, I had practical doubts, like what was going to happen as an implication of me knowing him, doubts about what would be the result of following him, like what should a life look like as a result of following Jesus? Lots of things uh, are pointed to, but so many of the things that we say are going to come or be a result of following Jesus are so vague. Like for instance, what is freedom in Christ? Right? That's something that we say, hey, if you become a Christian, you're going to experience freedom in Christ. I, didn't, I don't know if I could have told you back then what freedom of Christ is. And in one very obvious sense, I think freedom of Christ is that we become free, that that freedom means that there's, we're free to, to, to do stuff without fear of condemnation. But since that time, I've also learned another meaning, that freedom in Christ is, is, is this thing, that there's all these things that I don't have to do because I'm with Christ as well. There's these addictive things that we all can kind of be susceptible to, but those are things I don't have to do because I am free in Christ as well. So it's not just the things that I've done that I don't get, that don't get held against me, but there's these things that I don't have to do as well. And this was nuance I didn't know back in those days. My larger point is this, what do I make of myself being so passionate about God back then, but still understanding such a small fraction of who he is? What I knew I was passionate about, but back then I really only knew such an abbreviated small version of what I've come to know since then. And again, these doubts I had were not about the fundamental claims of Christ. I believed he lived and died and was raised from the dead, but it was the things that would happen as a result. What kind of person would I become? And if I told people about Jesus, what kind of person could they expect to become? You see, there was this public Chad that was very zealous, but inwardly, I was really questioning a lot of those kinds of things. Those doubts would come in. Back then, it seemed like the only thing for me to do as a result of having a faith in Christ was to do this really rather awkward thing called telling people about Jesus, right? Anybody had some bad experiences telling people about Jesus? It, it's hard to do, and especially in that time in my life when I was so zealous, it felt like this was the main task for me as a result of walking with him. 
about how he was the right way and about how all my friends who didn't walk with him were living in the wrong way. And I don't disagree in some broad sense with that, that it's, it's right to walk with Jesus and it's wrong not to. I, I agree with that. But I looked at my friends and I, I just kind of looked at them and they seemed, they seemed okay. In other words, they didn't seem like they were struggling because they weren't walking with Christ. Again, I didn't doubt the claims of Christ, but it did seem unclear to me what their life should look like as a result. This was all epitomized in my friend Steve and Steve's family. This was a family who, I was just over at their house all the time, right? They were just, it was kind of home based. Like I was refrigerator friendly, right? You know what that is? When you kind of walk in and just like, hey, this is my stuff, right? Of course it wasn't, but this was the kind of family that the, that, that family was, Steve's family was. And I spent a lot of time in high school in those years. And I remember lamenting and being so sad that this family wasn't a, a Christian family. And I w- so it, the church had implied for me in my training sort of at church, and then I could get thrust into the Rhodes family. Uh, the church had implied for me that people who didn't know Christ were essentially rebels. It was implied, again, not sort of like spelled out from it, but it was kind of all by implication Everybody knows the truth, but some consciously or unconsciously are suppressing that truth because they want the pleasure of sin instead. Again, that was something that I would have believed when I was 16 or 17 years old. But the Rhodes family, they didn't have that overt sin in their life. They didn't have that open rebellion. And I had learned that some had wanted sin more than holiness, and so they say no to Jesus. Again, by implication. And it was my job to walk around and to tell people that they need to wake up. To me, the lives of my friends, of all my friends who didn't know Christ, to me, I was taught that it was, their lives were like a train without a conductor careening down the tracks. And then I would re- reassure myself too that for me, my life, that Jesus had the wheel of my life. Thank you, Carrie Underwood, who hadn't come out with that song yet. But it would have described me, right? I believe that they were driverless and I was the one who had a driver. But I knew myself. I knew that privately my life did not look like Jesus was driving. And publicly I knew that my friend Steve's family did not look like their life was anything resembling a train careening down tracks without a conductor. Because Steve's family by all accounts was every bit as loving and kind and caring and welcoming uh, and generous as my family. Now listen, I don't want to get distracted in some of those details. I know that external morality doesn't equal salvation. Their kindness didn't earn them any measure of salvation. But remember, I didn't have a theological problem. My problem was that if Jesus was saving people from their sins, and if that fact was so intuitively important and automatically knowable as the best option for all of life, why did it seem like Steve's family could, could, recognize, could not recognize their need of a savior? Why did they seem so content the way they were? Because as a Christian, I saw myself on this hugely significant rescue mission. And the people I was going to rescue continually seemed to be saying to me, yeah, no thanks, to the help that I was offering. Uh, the, the logic goes that if you're around desperately thirsty people and you break down barriers to get to them with jugs of cool water, they will celebrate your arrival and happily drink. Well, Steve's family, my problem was, didn't seem very thirsty. And they didn't seem consciously or unconsciously rebelling against anything. They seemed content. They seemed fulfilled even. So looking at those pictures um, reminded me that the gospel I believed in then, the primary the function of the gospel was sin forgiveness, moral living, and heaven someday when I die. That was the, the gospel that I was sharing with my friends. That was uh, the sum total of everything that I could imagine they needed to know about Now certainly I believe in these things still, but what about now and the rest of my life until I get to heaven? Morality, sin, and heaven without a broader context quite simply is not the good news that Jesus was proclaiming. But I didn't know it then. You see, in other words, what he was proclaiming was bigger than that and it contained those things. But I didn't know what the bigger piece was. I just had those things 
And I was kind of giving it cut off from the larger context. So back to the Sistine Chapel. This, of course, is a strong focal point for that amazing fresco. It's the famous depiction, if we got a picture of it, uh, the famous depiction of creation. And God is making himself available to mankind, and mankind is reaching out, as our friends so, so, so well uh, illustrated for us. And I love this section of the Sistine Chapel. I, this, this, I mean, people have thought long and hard about just what you're looking at right there, right? It's God who is reaching and man who's kind of lounging and can't be bothered to reach back, right? There's so many implications to that. But to carry the analogy through even further, I want to affirm the truth of salvation through Jesus Christ. I even want to affirm the central importance of holiness and moral living and forgiveness of sins, even though we don't deserve it, and heaven when we die someday. These are indeed important as this super important distillation of the whole. But to say that this is all there is, That to see the Sistine Chapel and to think all you would need to do was to see this part, well, it just feels like some violation of something larger. To accurately portray the Sistine Chapel to scale, this famous section represented about this much of the whole. Probably that's too big, actually. I just wanted to make sure you could still see it. At the end of the day, there is the rest of the Sistine Chapel to take in. And why would we want to miss all that? The problem of Steve's family for me was that I was showing them one small section of the gospel. And while it was a significant section, an important section, um, it wasn't very automatically intuitive to them why that was the most important thing in the world. I was in a house recently that had a beautiful section, this beautiful section um, hung up in their house. And again, it reminded me how much I love that, like I said, particularly the part where man can't even be bothered to raise his finger back to reach out to God himself. But framing just this section while affirming the beauty of that section also says something about the rest of that fresco. It says that the rest of it is either not as important, not as clear, not as easily understandable, and largely just not as useful. It says that this is more important than all of the rest. And sharing my small framed gospel with Steve's family was like bringing them into the Sistine Chapel, tarping off everything else and saying, do do you like it? Do you like that? Are you impressed with with our, our fresco? It just seemed a little bit truncated, as they say. Doesn't the rest of the Sistine masterpiece beg to be known, explored and enjoyed? Additionally, doesn't the beauty of the one small section beckon onlookers to search out more? Some time ago, a uh, b- beloved Tory prof, and, and I'm honored to say my friend, Matt Jensen, uh, answered this question. He said, where has Christianity gone wrong in culture? Where has it sort of like gone off the rails a little bit? He said, Christianity has gone wrong when we reduce the message of the gospel. The world needs the full force of the gospel and we are shrinking away from it. So considering our analogy, he's saying the curator of the Vatican Museum has gone wrong in that he has started only showing one small significant section of the Sistine Chapel. But there is more, isn't there? There is, there's much more. And that one small section is beautifully significant, but is that small section all there is? Well, no, no, there's not. In fact, there are nine sections that make up that that fresco, all from scenes from the book of Genesis. Um, Each one incredibly intricate and beautiful. Um, Take a look at the the list of the sections. If you were to look in the, on the, um, at the the next, actually there's, yeah, that slide. What an amazing thing. Each one of those things is rich and deep and full. I want to read a fairly long part of scripture. You've heard a little bit. I want to read a little bit more than has already been read. Um, In other words, I want to uh, pull back a little bit more from the chapel ceiling for us to see. Just like seeing the rest of it for the first time, you will not see, you, you will see a lot more going on than forgiveness, sins, and morality in heaven. 
That's okay because the goal is not to put it, pin it all down and to understand it through and through. The goal is to let the mystery wash over you and for that thing in you to go, wait, if there's this much more, uh, I, I should know about all that. If there's this many things happening here. Um, and so I wanna just have you listen uh, from 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we're starting in one. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By, the gospel, you, by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. What he's saying is this. Essentially, here is the gospel. And he, what he does is he explains the gospel as I knew it when I was 16. And it is indeed important. That part of the Sistine Chapel is incredibly important and you must know about it. And Paul is reminding us about those parts of the gospel. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to scriptures and that he appeared to the Cephas, Peter, and, that, uh, and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Man, this is the basics, right? This is the core message. This is the distillation of the whole. This is that one section of the Sistine Chapel. At this point, we might be saying to ourselves, yeah, yeah, I've seen that section. I know that part of the gospel. But then Paul continues to hammer away from verses 12 to 20, which we've already heard. If need be, allow yourself to sort of get lost in the mystery here. Allow yourself to say, what gospel is Paul talking about? He seems to be extending the whole. He starts with the basics and then he begins to move out from there. Listen to this. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. Listen, what he's starting to do is he's saying, hey, yeah, you know, you see that, uh, that resurrection from the dead that Jesus did? That's the first fruit that we can now, as, as members of the gospel community, begin believing that there will be other resurrections of the dead. What? To my 16-year-old self, if you tell me that there is resurrection of the dead at all, I am going to, my, my, my brain is going to explode a little bit. Wait, I thought resurrection of the dead was what Jesus did, and it made him right, and it made us right, and it made them wrong, and it made us not rebellious, and it made them rebellious. But you're talking about, Paul's talking about something else here. I mean, there, there's more? He goes on, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Wow. Yeah, that was not the message I was telling people. That the same thing that happened to Jesus is going to be happening to more people than just him. Paul obviously says a lot here of which we understand and some of which we don't. Some of this may scare us, frighten us, or intimidate us. But I want our curiosity to be piqued by this passage. Because even if there's places where we don't fully understand it, at least we have to admit that it was said and stated. Because in my opinion, this was part of the good news that I was not familiar with. The resurrection of the dead being passed along to others, not just to Jesus. Resurrection not limited just to Christ's body, but to all things. Some of what he says sounds bigger than us, bigger than anything we have taken part of in church. You see, what he's talking about is resurrection of the dead, and it's not just this thing that locally happened to Jesus' body. It, he takes what happened to Jesus and he sees it as a signpost pointing ahead to some deeper reality. Paul is saying that what happened to Jesus is just the beginning. He looks ahead for the exact same thing to happen elsewhere, everywhere. 
I want to quickly mention three things in addition to forgiveness of sins and morality and heaven that Christ offers. Those things uh, fit inside this larger picture, maintaining their status as true, but all while not eclipsing the larger whole that Jesus has preached. In other words, forgiveness, moral living, and heaven are compatible with this fuller picture, but not, entire, but not the entirety of the whole. The work of Christ stands in direct conflict with what we'll call systems of death. That is systems that inch us toward death and ultimately lead us to just that, to death. And not just to death, but the death of all things, the death of relationships, the death of beauty, the death of adventure, the death of truth, the death of intimacy. Systems of death work against all of these. And three huge systems of death in our world that I want to mention are this. Selfishness, me only. Greed, me first. And then, of course, power, me above all others. Listen, these right here are systems of death that need to be resurrected, brought back to life, transformed. And the story of the Bible is of God who is working to put all of that back to right. And indeed, that story finds its climax in the life and work of Jesus Christ. And Paul sees it, and he invites us to see it too. Actually, for me, this is a place where I so love working with you college students. Some, sometimes it feels like you are more wired to hear this kind of more complete picture of the gospel than I was when I was 16. That it's somehow wired into your DNA in a different way than it was for previous generations. I see this in your desire for significance. Where we settled for a more personal gospel, your generation seems more intent on applying the good news more broadly. So that if good news for you, it also needs to be good news for the disabled, for the poor, for those born in this country with much and those born in and out of this country with a little. Your hearts seem to be so poised and ready to be sent to the nations or to the neighbor who struggles. I see in you a leadership that challenges me to push past the mere personal applications of scripture and the gospel and into the global structures that are in decline and in desperate need of Christ's resurrection life. It's you following people in, in your own generation that recognize that people who follow Christ in other nations are our brothers and sisters. And so if these nations are struggling, people in our family are struggling as well. And for you, that becomes a mandate that you all seem to understand better than my generation. It becomes marching orders for you to figure out what following Christ means, not just for you, but for everybody, every system, every structure, every state, every nation. Your generation has a search for significance and meaning that can at times be steered towards lesser things, posing as significant, but can easily rally back around that which is most meaningful and earth-shaking. I see this at Biola students, I see this at Biola and students drive to go serve in ministries and missions of all kind, either through uh, spiritual development ministries or through SMU or through uh, ministries at your local church. Your generation reminds all and calls us to something better and deeper than the mere personal application. That if this thing really is good for me, then it has got to be good for others as well. This was the immediate result of the arrival of the Holy Spirit after all, wasn't it? When the Spirit came, the implications were for your personal resurrection, but when the Spirit came, it was also about the resurrection of others and all things and all systems. If it is true that the gospel is about your personal access to Jesus, it is only true because that truth sits inside of a larger reality that's true of all things. And so today, uh, may God just sort of make you as you are now sort of unpacking all of Tory. And go to the slide right now so they can see uh, this fuller picture, this broader something. Can you pick out that small part? Like, why would we just say that one small part? If that whole is so beautiful, so wouldn't we want to tell that as well? Today, may God make us curious as you unpack all that you've learned and are thinking about through Tori. If your heart has been stirred by something, may God make your heart curious 
Because if it's true for us, how is it then also true for all of creation? Amen? Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.